All right, people, here we go. I just think it was one of those shows that you could experiment with, you could have fun with. The options were endless. You could do anything with the show. We're scientists. We have found a way to slide between one world and another. When I was working with Bob Weiss on another project, on a feature project, I was sitting in his office waiting to go into a meeting and there was actually a magazine with two Earths side by side in the cover of the magazine. And I had been reading a book about George Washington of all people and there was a moment in the Revolutionary War when George Washington was about to be shot by a bunch of the British and they all fired at him and when the smoke cleared he was still on his horse. And the whole point was that one of those bullets been well aimed, he's dead, there's no American Revolution, there's no United States. And I walked into Bob's office and said, I've got this weird idea for a TV series. <laughs> I had read a story that Robert Heinlein had written under a pen name called By His Bootstraps about a guy that meets himself in the future and in the past. I like to think of Sliders as sort of like Quantum Leap meets The Wizard of Oz. Where a group of people could travel not to different times but to parallel universes where it was always, you know, present day but in another universe. You could still meet yourself, you could meet versions of your friends, there could be differences in the culture, small ones, large ones. Uh, two whammy burgers with cheese, and I'll have the uh, super carnivore with fries and a cola. Okay, as I explained to your friend over there, I still need to see your salmonella insurance and your carbonated beverage release forms. You need all that just to serve me a burger? That's what's interesting because people get boring from time to time. I mean, you can't make people interesting unless you give them what? Alternate worlds. Because if not, you've got the same mundane situations going on and on. I'd sort of been Gene Roddenberry's protege at Star Trek, and he took me under his wing, and he basically said Star Trek was created because he wanted to say things about the world and he wasn't allowed to. You know, the president's about to speak. You mean President Clinton? Of course I mean Clinton. My fellow Americans, I speak to you tonight from the White House. If he set things on another planet, then he could say things and get away with it. When we were first developing the show, we realized that the show could be done as a straight science fiction show or as a black comedy with a lot of satire. We have some of the latest state-approved sounds here. Liberace Unplugged, Jim Morrison sings Irving Berlin, and uh, Kurt Cobain's Christmas album. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and ultimately, we decided to do something very ambitious, which was to do both. Um, it wasn't something that was very well received at first by Fox because they sort of want the show to be one thing. I think the whole parallel universe theme, uh, I think it, you know, feeds into not only darker episodes, but also you could have a lot of fun with that as well. You think we're home? I don't think so, Rembrandt. I'm pretty sure on our Earth, the mailmen wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the pilot, in lots of ways, is my favorite episode. And we wanted to do a good story that accurately portrayed uh, the promise of the series. September 13th, my attempt to create the world's first anti-gravity device has taken a decidedly bizarre turn. When I first read the pilot for Sliders, I was a junior at uh, New York University. You're too much like your father. Up all night, working crazy hours. And look what happened to him. He worked himself to death. Mom, Dad was hit by a car. But he was on his way to work. Kind of a different audition than, than any other I'd done before because he had me do the lines normally as Quinn Mallory, and then he had me do Quinn and the same exact lines as uh, someone who was like a very frightened, sort of a scaredy cat. And then he had me uh, do them all as like a tough guy. He's a little bit of a jock, and he is a little bit of a nerd. He's this really big six foot four guy. But he's got, he had this baby mentality that he had about him. I really went for it. There was nothing uh, half-assed about what I did in the audition, and uh, supposedly that's what got me the job. That's it? I got the job? What more do you want? Congratulations. It really got fun when I got to play off of John Rhys Davies. He can be a sourpuss to people who aren't used to the English. Mr. Pavarotti. I am not Mr. Pavarotti. Mr. Pavarotti is an Italian. He speaker like this. Do I speaker like this? No. Why? 
Because I am an Englishman, you blistering idiot! A lot of times his mouth would get him in trouble quite a bit. And people sometimes were taken back by it. When he had problems with the script, everybody knew about it. And I'll tell you, man, we were in read-throughs and John would bang his fist on the table and go, this is absurd, the show could be so good, why don't we do this and do this and do this? <laughs> John and I were hanging out so much. And not in a weird way, people, in like a, in like a very cool way. We were very close friends. John himself was the foundation. And when we lost John, I think deep down in our hearts, we knew that it was the beginning of the end. Clavant sang as much as he possibly could in the show. All those crying men singing scenes. And when they saw him singing, they thought, wow, this, uh, this is a gold mine here. We knew we had found someone that was a great performer, a lot of energy, fun. So I, I get in the cab, I go down to the uh, casting director. I go in, I sit down, and I, I, I'm reading the lines. And I, I guess I'm very dry of whatever it is I'm doing. And she is on the floor. And I'm like, I'm not funny. I don't, I don't find myself funny. And she's hysterical. She's calling the director in California. It's like, you got to see this guy. This guy's hysterical. A whole nation of squares. This reminds me of a solo gig I played in Florida once. The average age was deceased. He's like the kind of guy who's like playing a guitar, and you're like, wow, you're, you're really good on that. Have you been playing your whole life? He's like, no, man, I just picked it up last week. Just, you know, strumming along, checking it out. This thing's pretty easy, man. Wade Wells. Wade was the girl that everybody fell in love with all the characters fell in love with. Well, I thought it was much more effective to have them sort of be this unrequited love where every now and then it comes up that they really do have the hots for each other and they come very close to, to uh, doing something about it and then life sort of interferes and they're back to sliding for their lives again. It's sort of like we have a job to do. We have to get home and you don't want to let uh, a relationship get in the way of that. And you know what they say, keep those relationships out of the workplace. So uh, I guess the sliders didn't want any hanky-panky going on. We've been avoiding this issue for months. Issue? What are you talking about? Us. Ah! Ah! Sliding, the first bunch of times that we did it, the first few episodes, it was a lot of fun. You know, you get to roll around. Ah! Oh! Oh! I was wearing a radio mic on my back. And we went and we slid in and we rolled on the ground and this radio mic cracked me in the spine. <laughs> Oh, it just killed, and it killed me for like months after that. And I was just like, the sliding thing is not quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Man, I'm telling you, it hurt. It hurt. I'm getting awfully tired of the landing on my butt. John Reese Davies always insisted on a stuntman. Bob Weiss was really responsible for sort of getting the actual sliding process visual done. He worked with some special effects people and we fine-tuned it and we sort of added colors and tried different things. What we chose to do was something that was uh, brief, exciting, was cool, that you look forward to it opening up and then sliding through before it closed again. And most important for a uh, series is we wanted something that we could reproduce because it would be one of the signatures of the show. There's a lot of cameras, there's motion control where they take a shot of you dressed as regular Quinn and then they take the same shot as the other Quinn that scene in the pilot where I'm talking to myself I mean it took two weeks to, to shoot that if you do something in television that's even a little bit different it stands out like a neon sign I always felt let's push the envelope I mean we're going to other worlds let's be bold and let's do very bold things unfortunately you know the network is, is used to sort of doing things a certain way, and it was always a fight and always a struggle to try to push the envelope. Has that always been here? Who, Abe? Yeah. No. Lenin. Nikolai Ilyich Olyanov Lenin. That's what was so great about the show, is that they could take social issues out of the headlines and just make an alternative universe. As Ronald Reagan said, I'd rather have been in Philadelphia. He's Ronald Reagan. Invasion was a very, very important show. Um, I had wanted to create these villains, and I wanted them to be these, this alternate group of apes that had evolved on another Earth, but differently than we had. And Fox said, absolutely not. 
and it frustrated me for the whole season. And I finally went and I sat and had lunch with the president of Fox Television and just pled my case, said, please, please let me do this show. They wanted a bad guy in the show. We, we didn't have a bad guy. And I think X-Files had Smoking Guy and Star Trek had Klingons and I think they came up with this Cro-Mag thing. Cro-Max, Cro-Max, who the devil are the Cro-Max? They're marauders, killers, and they eat eyes, human eyes. A lot of the email and a lot of letters we got back from the audience was that, yes, thanks, but no thanks. Let's go back to where we were. It was cooler to deal with sort of the human element of going to different universes than just having like a set of bad guys in like freaky makeup. I also like the episode uh, Eggheads, which was uh, kind of a quirky thing about a world where the really smart guys rather than the really athletic guys are revered as uh, celebrities and stars. I wrote a um, public service announcement on a show called Eggheads, which was a group of rappers who were rapping about going to the library. <laughs> Moving down the aisle with my homies in tow. We're grooving in the home of the librarian. Yo. She checks us out from behind thick glasses we walk right past and we wiggle our asses. There was an episode that we shot where all the men got killed off because of some virus and, you know, Clavant, John, and I were the only three guys left on, on the earth. That was particularly fun for me. I, I like those kind of odds. How did you escape the virus? Well, we, um, took a lot of vitamins. <laughs> the first dinosaur episode that we did. That was fun. That was interesting. That was a challenge. We also knew that Clavant had a twin brother who was an identical twin. And we thought we would have a lot of fun by doing this, setting up the kind of shots that you always do when you're only using one actor and you're doing split screen. So we purposely set shots up like that so it would look like, of course, that's what we're doing. And then they would touch or do different things and people would say, how do they do that? I gotta tell you, that torture shot with me with all the electrodes all over me, Still to this day, you know, people send me those pictures and they want me to sign that one. It's so funny, the one where I'm naked with all the electrodes all over me. I don't mind it when the girls send it, it's when some of the guys in prison send it that it kind of freaks me out a little bit. I think in, in science fiction you develop such a loyal fan base that you sort of have to end on cliffhangers, you know? Uh, a lot of great sci-fi shows have to end on cliffhangers. I think we were all in on the decision to end season one with a cliffhanger. You want to leave the audience wanting more. <laughs> My original concept was to do a funeral scene for Quinn. Let's open the second season with his funeral. This became a real huge battle. I mean, it was a monumental battle between me and the network because I just, they, their attitude was the show's been off the air for a while, no one's gonna care. Just start with a new episode and pretend like none of it happened. And I thought, well, what a sure way to alienate your audience. It's just a sign of telling them we don't really care about you. So ultimately, they allowed me to do a compromise. I wrote a, about a two minute payoff, which was written as an island to itself so it could be inserted into any episode. No! I remember when I got on Crossing Jordan, uh, some of the guys at NBC were like, wow, you have a pretty big fan base out there. And I was like, sliders, man. And they were like, wow. We wanted to give them something really solid, wonderful, and interesting, and they deserved it. Because they were there every weeknight, they are watching that show and even watching reruns. I think the sliders fans have been some of the most loyal out there uh, from day one. Science fiction fans are like a beautiful woman. You gotta treat her right. You gotta bring her flowers. You gotta treat her with respect. Because the second you disrespect her, she's out the door and she's going out with some mogul. I just learned so much doing all those different episodes, getting set up in all those parallel universes. Now working as an adult, um, nothing faces me. You know, I've, I've pretty much seen everything before from my experiences on Sliders.